Hello again, and welcome to the 2021 Ole Miss Choral Symposium. I'm Don Trott, Director of Choral Activities here at the University of Mississippi. Tonight, we continue our five-part series titled Performing Renaissance Music, a Virtual Symposium on Historical Performance with our presenter, Dr. Dennis Schrock. Tonight, we present part two, Sound and Pitch. On behalf of the University of Mississippi, I welcome you, and now it is my pleasure again to welcome Dennis Schrock. Thank you, Dr. Trott. Our topic in this video is devoted to the two interrelated subjects of sound and pitch. Sound being discussed in three categories. One, the types and numbers of voices and instruments we employ. Two, the volume of the sounds produced by the voices and instruments. And three, the timbre or quality of the sounds our singers and instrumentalists make, including the consideration of vibrato and blend. The subject of pitch, also in three categories, will be discussed in terms of one, pitch levels, two, transposition, and three, ethos, which includes consideration of tuning systems. All these categories are self-explanatory except for ethos, which I define as the internal quality or sonic color of pitches and keys as they affect the stability and expressiveness of the music we perform. I'll explain more later. But first, I want to remind you of the correlation between the visual and aural arts of the Renaissance era. And I want us to have visual images in our mind's eyes as we discuss sound and pitch. In video one, devoted to sources and forces, I showed paintings, sculptures, architecture, and imagery to demonstrate the rich expressiveness of the visual arts. In video two here, I want to show more of these, but with a focus on their unified expression in terms of color and design. For paintings, let's turn to the master of the era, Leonardo da Vinci. I'd show you the Mona Lisa, but its original coloration has dulled considerably over the years, and the painting is in need of restoration, which won't, unfortunately, happen because the Louvre is unwilling to remove it from public view for the years the restoration process would take. We can look instead at Ginevra da Vinci, which was painted at about 1474, when Leonardo was in his early 20s, and which is now in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., the only painting, by the way, of Leonardo in the United States. I'm showing it here for Leonardo's brush stroke technique, referred to as sfumato, which translates as smoke or fume, and which means in painting a shading of images or softening of lines between colors. This can be seen most obviously in the subtle variations of one color in Ginevra's face, but also in the rest of the painting, which is limited to pretty much singular color palettes. And here is Leonardo's final painting, Salvatore Mundi, which sold at auction in 2017 for $453.3 million. That's correct. $450.3 million, the most expensive painting in the world. It shows even more subtle use of the sfumato effect. Note the clear orb in Jesus' left hand, the orb representing the world, as in the title of the painting, the savior of the world. And note also that Leonardo unifies the painting by use of a limited color palette and sfumato paintings all around. For sculptures, we turn to Michelangelo as the master of that genre, and we see similar uses of color shadings. In his famous Pietà, carved between 1498 and 1499 when he was 23, it was considered so beautiful it was displayed in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, where it continues to reside. I show it to you here for the folds of cloth on Mary's head and dress, which are not just expressive in their dimensional carvings, 
but also in their shadings of color. Similar is Michelangelo's sculpture of Moses, mostly carved between 1513 and 1515, when he was in his late 30s, and commissioned for the tomb of Pope Julius II for the church of San Pietro in Vincoli. Giorgio Vasari wrote the following about the sculpture in his book, The Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptures, and Architects of 1568. Michelangelo finished the Moses in marble, unequaled by any modern or ancient work. Seated in a serious attitude, he rests with one arm on the tables and with the other holds his long, glossy beard, the hairs so difficult to render in sculpture, being so soft and downy that it seems as if the iron chisel must have become a brush. For architecture, I want to show you two ceilings. The first, the Chapel of King's College, Cambridge, the ceiling, which is the largest fan vault construction in the world, was erected between 1513 and 1515. And as with the Michelangelo sculptures, the vaulting stands out because of the various shadings of the stonework, the variations of one basic color. Second is the ceiling of Saint-Chapelle in Paris, one of the great sites of architecture with its singular color of blue dotted with gold stars. For imagery, I introduced and showed in video one this page from the Mira Calligraphe Monumenta, translates as the Model Book of Calligraphy, which was created between 1591 and 1596, and which is comprised of 129 pages of highly decorative scripts with illuminations of flowers, fruits, and insects. I'm now showing two more pages, not only for their expressive imagery, but for each page's focus on one single style of calligraphy and one basic coloration. I also previously showed a couple of photos of the Gubbio Studiola, a small room for study and contemplation designed by Francesco di Giorgio Martini in 1478 for Duke Federico da Montefelto and his palace in the town of Gubbio, Italy. Here, for architecture and imagery combined, you can see inlaid wood designed as a trompe d'oeil, or trick of the eye, to show what seems to be three-dimensional placements of things, but which are actually flat surfaces. There are no open cabinet doors and benches protruding from the wall in the first photo, and there is no lectern standing on a bench in the second photo. The effect of three dimension is achieved by the subtle arrangement of wood or the subtle shadings of wood in its natural coloration. In all the visual artworks we've seen, the sfumato effect in the paintings by Leonardo da Vinci, the shadings of marble in Michelangelo's sculptures, the ceilings of King's College Chapel and Saint-Chapelle, the calligraphy in the Mira Monumenta, and the inlaid wood in the Gubbio Studiola, the designs, however intricate and expressive, were created with a limited color palette. I hope you'll keep this in mind as I talk about the color limitations of sound and pitch. Back to our original outline of topics, I'll not spend much time discussing the types and numbers of voices and instruments because it doesn't matter so much who is performing as how they are performing, and also because we don't have ready huge supplies of boys or castrados to sing treble parts, adult males to sing the alto parts, or ensembles of recorders, gambas, and sackbuts. That having been said, choirs of boys and men generally sang sacred music, masses, motets, and other liturgical genre, while vocal chamber groups, one singer per part, sang secular music, madrigals, chansons, and part songs. The ensembles for sacred music 
were usually comprised of boys singing the treble parts with male altos, tenors, and basses. Castrados also sang both soprano and alto parts and were in many court, chapel, and cathedral choirs of Italy, including the Mantua court, the Ferrara court, and in the Munich court while it was led by Orlando di Lasso. The Sistine Chapel Choir, with written endorsements by Pope Sixtus V and Clement VIII, had castrados throughout the second half of the 16th century. The following list gives an idea of the composition and sizes of choirs in Italy and England. All the members were male. Milan Cathedral, 19 singers. Florence, 14. Bologna, 16 to 18. Sistine Chapel from 1513 to 1521, 23 singers. The Sistine Chapel from 1523 to 1534, 24. Treviso, 13. Christ Church, Oxford, 24. And King's College, Cambridge, 28 singers. Sacred music was, of course, also sung by choirs of female voices, but not in combination with male choirs. The female choirs for sacred music were in convents. Adult females did, however, sing secular music with male singers, these ensembles comprised of one singer per part. As depicted in this painting by an anonymous 16th century French artist, the painting now in the Musée du Berry in Bourges. And there were one singer per part ensembles comprised of only females. Most famous was the ensemble Concerto della Donne, which translates as Consort of Ladies, created in 1580 by Alfonso II, Duke of Ferrara, and popular at the court until the end of the century. At the peak of their fame, there were three ladies, all sopranos, and a number of composers wrote for them, including Lodovico Agostino, Jacques de Vert, Luca Morenzio, Carlo Gesualdo, and Luzzasco Luzzaschi, who also accompanied the ladies in many of their concerts. Shown here is the cover page of Luzzaschi's book of madrigals for one, two, and three sopranos. And beside the cover, is a page of his madrigal, O Dolcets Amarissime. We assume the one singer per part practice of singing secular music from a number of sources, including what are referred to as table scores, such as this of John Dowland's lute song, Shepherd in a Shade. The four singers performing the song sat around each other with the score laid out between them on a table, the soprano on the left, and the alto, tenor, and bass parts facing in different directions on the right. There were also packets of small handheld part books, such as these chansons by Orlando Di Lasso. Each singer held his or her own part book. This is the frontest page of the part book. The table of contents, the first chanson, the second and third chanson. This is the superior or soprano book, and I have facsimile copies of all four part books. When instruments were used, either by themselves or with voices, they were generally played in consorts. That is, a family of like instruments would play all the parts of a composition the soprano, alto, tenor, and bass parts. This is really, really important. Michael Pretorius depicts families of recorders, gambas, and brass instruments in these plates from his Syntagma Musicum Treatise of 1619. Reinforcing the common usage of instruments in consorts, Massimo Troiano, in his Dialoghi of 1569, describes the music performed during a feast following the marriage of Duke Wilhelm V of Bavaria and René of Lorraine in 1568. Quote, during the first course, 
the musicians of the royal duke played a variety of delightful compositions, among them a seven-voiced motet by Orlando di Lasso with five high coronets and two trombones. During the second course, the musicians played several six-voiced works, among them a wonderful madrigal by Alessandro Strigio with six large trombones. To accompany the third course were various six-voiced motets, including one by Cipriano de Rore with six violins, or gamba. Thus, the sound was the same from voice part to voice part, like the overall color of the artworks was the same throughout the work, painting, sculpture, ceiling, image, or wall surface. You can hear the unity of sound in this recording of a lasso madrigal, Echo Que Pur Vi Lasso, from a collection of madrigals composed in 1587. In the recording, by Die Gruppe für Alte Musik, conducted by Martin Zerbeli, a consort of gambas plays all parts of the five-part madrigal. Note that the gambas have transposed the madrigal down, and that they play short, repeated passages of music on page two, softer as echoes. Note also the nuanced phrasing and soft and refined timbre. Consorts of instruments not only took the place of, or played along with vocal parts, coloparte, chord-producing instruments such as organs, harpsichords, and lutes often accompanied the voices. We know this from commentary about the practice and from manuscripts of actual organ reductions of vocal parts, many of these organ reductions written by the music copyist at Westminster Abbey, Adrian Batten, and contained in what has been titled the Batten Organ Book. As you can see in the anthem, Give Alms of Thy Goods by Christopher Tye, the organ parts replicate most of the vocal parts except for repeated notes. You can see this in the bass part in measure one, the tenor part at the end of measure two, the alto part at the beginning of measure three, and the alto and tenor parts at the end of measure four. Or some of the organ parts, as in Lord for thy tender mercy's sake, variously attributed to Richard Farrant and John Hilton, are thin in texture and show only the soprano and bass vocal parts, leaving the other parts to be filled in as desired and as practical by the organist. Whether sacred or secular, 
sung by choirs or chamber ensembles with one singer per part, performed by boys, men, women, or castrados, played by consorts of instruments, or accompanied by organ, the volume of sound was soft and refined. Many primary sources of the Renaissance era give ample description of, of soft volumes, including this by Hermann Fink in his treatise Practica Musica of 1556. In the chapter of the treatise entitled On the Art of Singing Elegantly and Sweetly, Fink says, A discant singer, soprano, sings with a tender and soothing voice but a bass sometimes with a sharper and heavier quality. The middle voices sing their melodies with a uniform sound and pleasantly strive to adapt themselves to the other voices. Let there be another care among singers. The beginning of a piece should not sound different than the ending, and the voice should not waver, but, as in organs, the harmony should remain tranquil and steady. Then, lest one disturb another, it should be seen that no singer strains his voice or that no singer changes his tone color and utters bleeding and barbaric cries. Basses can make raucous noises indeed, like a hornet enclosed in a leather pouch, or they exhale like a pierced balloon. What pleasantness is there in this? What charm? How can this variety of singing please? Singing arises from thoroughly refined and well-blended voices. Harmony and consonants should flow equally onto the ears, so that one voice like another, the high one as well as the low, becomes soft, gentle, and clearly understood, whereby the hearts of the hearers are filled with wonder and the mind is pleasantly affected. This is a gold mine of information, ladies and gentlemen, and to comprehend how it applies to the volume and quality of sound, let's isolate the descriptions. In purple are the adjectives that refer to volume, elegantly and sweetly in the chapter title, tender and soothing in the first paragraph, tranquil in the second paragraph, pleasantness and charm in the fourth paragraph, and soft and gentle in the, five, in the final paragraph. Nine adjectives that are all in agreement and that all reinforce each other. The words in green refer to blend, as in all the voices are of one timbre. In paragraph one, the middle voices adapt themselves to the other voices. In paragraph three, no singer changes his tone color. And in paragraph four, thoroughly refined and well-blended voices. And the words I've underlined in blue comment on vibrato or lack of it. In paragraph two, the voice should not waver, but remain steady. Quotes from other sources reinforce Fink's opinions. For example, this by Vincenzo Galilei the father of the astronomer Galileo, in his treatise Dialogo della Musica Antica e della Moderna of 1581. The good singer will always endeavor to deliver his song with all the suavity and sweetness in his power, rejecting the notion that music must be sung boisterously. For a man of this latter mindset seems to appear among other singers like a plum among oranges, or like a man of unkempt appearance among city people of fine breeding. And as further testimony of softness, Vincenzo Giustiani describes the performance of a cornet player in his treatise Discorso Sopra la Musica of 1628. He played many times in one of my salons to the accompaniment of a cembalo, which was closed up and could scarcely be heard. However, the playing of the coronet was with such moderation, it astonished many gentlemen present because the coronet did not overshadow the sound of the cembalo. There is no doubt that performance at soft volume levels was idealized and that 
loud volumes were disparaged. Timbre of sound is just as easily explained, but not so easily accepted by everyone, since people today have adopted different views about what timbres they like. Some that are rich and muscular, as we hear very often on recordings when singers attempt to be expressive and sing at loud volume levels, and some timbres bright and driven, as in many contemporary British choirs that attempt to fill their large cathedral spaces. But rich, muscular, bright, and driven are contrary to and in conflict with the soft volumes idealized during the Renaissance. And the many primary source adjectives that describe softness, tender, soothing, tranquil, pleasant, charming, refined, soft, gentle, suave, and sweet, also indicate timbre. And then there are also, of course, the adjectives that tell us what sounds to avoid, sharp, heavy, bleating, barbaric, raucous, and boisterous. Moreover, we have the admonition to blend and to not change timbres. But let me ask, are softness of volume and sweetness of timbre necessary for performance today? Are they important to the manifestation and appreciation of the repertoire? My answer is, of course, a resounding, but soft and sweet, yes. The quality of tone is as critical an element of music as are the pitches and rhythms. Tone is an internal component of the music just as color is an internal component of a painting. And just as we don't alter the color of a Renaissance painting because we may not like that color, we shouldn't feel free to alter the quality of tone in music, whatever our reasons. Music should be treated with the same respect as the visual arts both art forms being presented according to historically informed directives, being restored to their original conceptions. We should, as we do with the visual arts, enter into the sonic world of the Renaissance when performing its music. We should not alter the sonic quality of music according to principles of the 21st century. For us today, it is especially critical that we establish a timbre and maintain it throughout a piece of music and that we match timbres from voice part to voice part. This is what I tried to accomplish in Josquin de Pre's motet, Ave Maria Virgo Serena, sung by the Santa Fe Desert Corral. Whether matching timbres in the imitative phrases at the beginning of the motet, striving to have the female altos complement the male tenors singing in identical ranges, limiting the volume at the bottom of page two and top of page three when the text full of solemn joy fills heaven and earth with new rejoicing suggests a louder volume, and maintaining timbre and volume on page six when the texture becomes thicker.
you may have noted that the score of the motet shows C major, which is what is indicated in the original manuscript, in which I showed in the prefatory bar, but the chorale sang the motet a half step higher. We did this for one, because there was no identification of pitch levels during the Renaissance era. There was no standard of pitch such as we have today with A equals 440 hertz. The pitch C could be anywhere within the boundaries of vocal and instrumental ranges of a composition and within their abilities to produce the pitches with comfort. As Michael Pretorio says, pitch is established so that singers can perform their parts without becoming hoarse from a too highness of range. Furthermore, the voice sounds much more pleasant in the middle and lower part of its range. We chose our pitch of C for the Josquin Motet so that the ranges of pitch were comfortable for the singers, especially in the low ranges of the alto part. But we also chose a C that seemed to be inherent in the music itself a pitch that seemed to belong to the music, an ethos that gave us pitch stability and ease of tuning. Many of you know the experience of performing music from the Renaissance era in the key of its modern-day published edition and fighting to keep the choir in tune. The singers often go flat, which of course results in a rehearsal process that is frustrating and in performances that are unsatisfactory, and un unenjoyable. But if you raise the pitch by a half step, the music stays in tune. How logically odd. At one pitch level, the music goes flat, but at a half step higher or lower, it stays in tune. This is because the keys as we know them today of C major, G major, and especially F major have an ethos that is contrary to the music of the Renaissance. Many of you who have pif perfect pitch know this. C major, G major, and F major are just lackluster. But keys such as B major, E major, and F sharp seem to have an ethos that fits the music almost magically. We need to grasp the concept that pitch levels are variable, and we need to find levels that are comfortable for the singers and that have an ethos that fits and serves the music, B, E, and F sharp, as well as A and D, seem to do this, and they are the modern day keys I often go to, and when I do, I don't have to worry about tuning. Here is Hans Leo Hosler's motet Dixit Maria, which we see published in F major, but which you'll hear here, sung a half step higher in F sharp, by Via Veritate on the recording Renaissance Reborn. <laughs>
This recording, which is available from GIA and which is a companion to the book Performing Renaissance Music, has all the pieces sung in ethos favorable keys, including, for instance, John Farmer's Fair Phyllis in F sharp and Robert Parsons' Ave Maria in B. Beyond selecting a pitch level for its quality of ethos and or comfortable ranges, one can also transpose compositions from one key to another, transposition being a practice that was quite common during the Renaissance. The reason for transposition is part of the si placet, as you please mentality of performance, with performers changing keys to accommodate particular needs of an ensemble. For example, I wanted to perform Clodin de Sermisi chanson, Longuir me fait, with the men of the Santa Fe Desert Chorale. So I transposed it from its original scoring for STTB, which you can see here with its original clefs. I transposed it down a minor third for TTBB. Here is that transposition. No. I also wanted to perform Vittoria's Motet Duo Seraphim with the men. So I transposed the original scoring for SSAA in F major down a fifth in B flat major for TTBB. And you'll hear this recording in the next video when I discuss tempo. For now, I'd like to do a reverse transposition. That is, I'd like to take a piece that has been transposed in modern times and perform it as it was originally scored. This is the popular anthem, If Ye Love Me by Thomas Tallis, which we see scored today always in F major, our most unfavorite key for SATB, but which was originally scored a fourth lower in C major for A-T-T-B. Here are the men of the Santa Fe Desert Corral. <laughs> Thank you.
Once a pitch level or key has been chosen, one should consider the issue of tuning or temperament and decide on a system of tuning and, accordingly, the relative distance between intervals as they are performed melodically and as they are also sounded vertically in chords. We are accustomed to equal temperament tuning today, a system in which all the intervals of the chromatic scale are divided equally. This means that no single interval within an octave is pure, but that minor adjustments are made to achieve equality between all the intervals and purity from octave to octave. Earlier systems of tuning were based on the purity of intervals considered consonant at the time. During the medieval and very early years of the Renaissance, the Pythagorean system of tuning was in favor, with the intervals of a fifth and fourth tuned poor, pure, but with the major and minor thirds compromised and out of tune since these intervals were considered dissonant. During the later years of the Renaissance, when the interval of a major third was considered a consonance, two other systems became favored, mean tone tuning, more specifically called quarter comma mean tone tuning, or just or pure intonation. I'll go with just intonation. These systems were discussed in various treatises of the time, including those by Bartolome Ramos de Pareja in 1482, Pietro Aron in 1523, Giuseppe Zarlino in 1558, and Michael Pretorius in 1619. Just intonation was similar to mean tone tuning in regard to basic frequencies. However, and this is so important <clears throat> for us especially, just intonation, which attempted to make all intervals pure, was flexible. Intervals were not set in a rigid fashion, but were adjusted both melodically and harmonically according to their function in music. Melodically, minor seconds were narrower when leading tones resolved to tonic notes as in musica ficta, and when six scalar degrees led to dominant notes, as in musica recta. And as a result of this phenomenon, cross relations did not create the biting dissonance they do in equal temperament tunings. Also harmonically, thirds were tuned in chords higher as a manifestation of pulchritudinous beauty. Performing today in equal temperament tuning is a necessity is if one is using an organ with standard keys. However, just intonation is preferable if possible, especially if one is performing with voices alone. Intervals, both within melodic lines and also in vertical chords, will have an opportunity to settle into various degrees of purity. Some will be wider, than in equal temperament tuning, and some system, some of the tones will be narrower. This is of rather critical importance when performing cross relations, as in an F sharp simultaneous with an F natural, which occurs at the end of William Byrd's Ave Verum Corpus, or when A natural and G natural coincide with A sharp and G-sharp at the end of Thomas Wilkes' anthem when David heard that Absalom was slain. This is what you can see in the second measure of the excerpt here. The soprano having the A and G naturals, 
against the tenor A and G sharps. In equal temperament tuning, as played on a piano in rehearsal, the pitches would sound as a harsh dissonance. But in just intonation, the naturals are a bit lower and the sharps a bit higher, thus mollifying the dissonance. Here is how this sounds in a performance by the Santa Fe Desa Corral on their CD entitled Transcendence. Note also, our attempt to make the two soprano parts sound identical to each other, our choice of pitch a half step below the original notation, and our ethos of key, which is basically there. But for those of you who have perfect pitch, our beat is a little bit lower, and we became comfortable with this because this is where the music seemed to want to be.
In summary, qualities of sound and pitch are significant and consequential elements of performance. From volume and timbre to pitches that fit within the ranges of singers and instruments, and from key centers that reveal an expressive ethos of music to intervallic tunings that manifest melodic and harmonic function and textual meaning. The characteristics of sound establish the most obvious and appreciable aural component of performance. Sound can enhance the intrinsic qualities of music and be inviting and engaging, thus creating a positive oral experience, or sound can be at odds with the music and be unattractive and off-putting, thereby creating a passive or negative oral experience. Sound creates an immediate and profound impact on performance. With this in mind, I encourage you to perform with levels of volume that maintain a quality of sweetness, select a pitch level and key that will accommodate singers and instruments comfortably within their ranges, and that will give you stability of pitch and an ethos of beauty. And feel free to transpose the music for your particular needs or desires. Thank you. Happy Renaissance music making. Thank you, Dr. Schrock. And we look forward to tomorrow evening when we present part three, Meter and Tempo. Thank you all for watching.